Welcome to the Lord's house. Let us quieten our hearts in preparation for the worship of our Almighty God. call to worship is taken from Psalm 138, verses 1 and 2. I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Amen. Congregation, let us arise and praise our God with the opening hymn, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. Our God and our Lord, the Creator of heaven and earth, we sing of thy mighty power that made that mountains to rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. We sing of thy goodness that bestows upon us health, strength, mercy, 
grace and countless blessings that we may live and serve thee. This morning, we come to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in thy temple. O Lord, be very near to us and speak to us through the preaching of thy word with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Forgive us all of our sins, wash us by the precious blood of Jesus, that our worship and prayer to thee will be accepted. We are mindful that our days on this earth are numbered, and we must redeem the time, for the days are evil. Therefore, we seek thy wisdom to live each day according to thy divine will. May thy Holy Spirit perform a great work in and through us, that we may be lights of this world and salt of the earth, as what thou hast called us to be. We commit to this morning's worship service unto thee, that it will be mightily used by thee to convert and transform sinners and turn every sin to be more and more like Christ. Be with the preacher and children's teachers who will divide thy word. Be with us, adults and children, as we learn of thy word. May every heart look to thee for comfort, strength and assurance. May all who hear thy truth trust in thee and obey thy precepts. We pray all this in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and for thy glory. Amen. Please remain standing as we read Ephesians chapter 5 responsively. Please turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We will read verse 1 to verse 33 responsively. I will begin with verse 1. Be therefore followers of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be one's name among you, as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and rise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, 
redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but it filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit. <clears throat> For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the Church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Verses 31 to 33 together. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the Church, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Please be seated. May the Lord grant us understanding and obedience of heart through the reading of his holy word. Let us now sing hymn 262, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord. of the Board of Elders, I greet one and all in the blessed name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Please turn to page 7 of your bulletin for the announcements. There is an announcement for 
all new teachers, assistant teachers and helpers of GCM, those who are starting to serve the Lord from July onwards, please take note that you will need to meet preacher Kelvin Lim. Sorry, it has already been passed, so I trust that you have already met him at 10.40 a.m. If you have not done so, please look for him or contact him. You may also refer to the link given for your duty. All right, that is the roster for your duty. Kababayan Bible study. The speaker is preacher Jeremiah Sim, and the Bible study will be held in the home of brother Randy Lorenzo. It is on Friday, this Friday, 1st July at 7.30 p.m. All youths and young adults to take note, this Saturday, there is Bible study. For the youths, it will be held on this Saturday at 2 p.m. at GMC. Preacher Cornelius Koshi is teaching on the book of 1 Corinthians. For the young adults, Preacher Ho Kihau is teaching on the topic, Keep Back from Presumptuous Sins taken from Esther chapter 6, verses 6 to 12. Parents, to take note, there will be a concurrent children's program for children aged 4 to 12. Holy Communion for the month of July, it will not be held on the first Sunday. Instead, it will be held on the second Sunday, which is the 10th of July. On the Lord's Day, 14th of August, there is... Baptism, reaffirmation of faith, and transfer of membership. Parents of young infants seeking baptism for their children and brethren from like-minded churches seeking transfer of church membership, together with the brethren who have completed your catechism class held in the first half of 2022, please register with Deacon Norafel by next Lord's Day, 3rd July. If you have any questions, you may refer to Elder Choi or Elder Francis Lee. Turning to page 8, continue to give your tithes, offerings and love gifts to Gethsemane BP Church via bank transfer. For love gifts to GBWL, you may also use a bank transfer method with a different DBS current account number or you may pay now to the UEN number. If you have not downloaded the church app, please do so by searching for Gethsemane BPC in your app store, where you can find hundreds of ser sermons and resources to help you in your spiritual growth. For all other weekly meetings, please refer to the centre column of your bulletin, a special reminder to all of us to come for our Tuesday night prayer meeting, which will be held in this auditorium. Before I hand the time to preacher Cornelius for the message, let us arise and join me in the intercessory prayer. Please arise. Almighty God, our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the privilege to pray unto Thee as a church. Thou hast sustained and protected us from the severe effects of the pandemic. Above all, we thank Thee for keeping us in the faith, for Thou art the one who gives us eternal life, and no man is able to pluck us out of Thy mighty hand. We were once lost, but now and found. We were once blind, but now we see. Oh, what an amazing grace Thou hast bestowed unto us by sending Thy only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be the propitiation for our sins. Then in Him we have redemption through His blood. And now we thank Thee that we are reconciled to Thee through Christ's righteousness imputed to us. What can we then say but to praise Thee and serve Thee joyfully with the lives of that Thou hast given to each and every one of us. Thank You, Lord, for the many ministries that Thou hast established in this church, where we can provoke one another 
unto love and good works by our fellowship, prayers, and service as co laborers in the Lord's vineyard. May thou defend and protect all these ministries so that thy people, from the youngest to the oldest, will not be deprived of the milk and meat of thy holy word, but to grow as faithful soldiers of Christ, fighting a good fight of faith daily in this sin-filled world. We also thank thee, Lord, for calling us to be a soul-winning church that not only proclaims the gospel of Christ, but also fulfills the great commission beyond this shore. We pray for thy appointed servants in Gethsemane's mission fields to China, Ethiopia, India, Malaysia, and the Philippines. We thank thee for opening many gospel doors for these men to win souls and to edify the saints. We commit them unto thy loving hand, praying particularly for Reverend Regor in Cebu, Elder Eliezer in Bogor and San Antonio, Preacher Edsel in Bohol, Reverend Dono in Pangasinan, Reverend Ephraim, Preacher Imani, Preacher Baera, and Preacher Bidada in Alamgena, and Preacher Ingida in Addis Ababa. Preacher Samson, ministering to brethren in Kuching, East Malaysia, as well as Reverend Sujith in Vaisak, India. We pray for thy preacher in China, who is making his way to Singapore with his wife and children to seek refuge and to deepen his knowledge of thy holy scripture in FEBC. O Lord, may thou protect all these missionaries and their families from the devil's ploys to distract them from the Lord's work and to seek to destroy their testimonies and effectiveness in their ministries. In places where they face great opposition and persecution, may thou strengthen their faith and trust in thee and give them greater zeal to serve thee in their afflictions. We also want to remember our pastor, Sister Caroline and Brother Andronicus, who are in Kerala, India, ministering to Bishop Koshi and Mrs. Molly with thy word and their practical help. May their presence be a great encouragement to this elderly couple and above all, the fellowship of the saints and ministry of the word will comfort and strengthen their hearts. We pray for journey mercies and thy protection upon pastor, wife and son in all their travels and may thou bring them back safely to Singapore in due course. We now commit brethren who are going through adversities of life. Help them to be still and know that thou art the one true and living God who is faithful to all thy children and cares for them. Even in the darkest tunnel that they are in right now, let them see the light of Christ and walk each step by faith, trusting and obeying thee, even when it seems so difficult and lonesome. Thank you for being so patient, so long-suffering towards us. And when we walk not according to thy will and fall into the miry clay and face the subsequent dire consequences, thou art still very near us when we repent of our waywardness. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort us. May the adversities of life and the consequences that we face draw us even so closer to thee that our faith, our trust in thee will increase more and more each day. Help us to keep obeying thee and keep walking in holiness and righteousness according to thy infallible word, even when obstacles and challenges are piling before us. For we know that they are all allowed by thee and they will ultimately work out for good to those who are called according to thy purpose. Now, Lord, as we open thy sacred pages, we pray for thy Holy Spirit to illumine our hearts and minds so that we may behold wonderful truths from thy Holy Scripture. Be with thy messenger this morning, preacher Cornelius, and grant unto him divine unction from above to declare and proclaim thy authoritative word for the edification of thy people and for thy glory. Be thou exalted and magnified 
in the heart of every believer and your saving grace upon those who are still outside thy kingdom. Thank you for hearing our prayers. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. This morning's sermon is entitled, No Desertion Nor Divorcement, Says the Lord, taken from Matthew and 1 Corinthians. I will now invite preacher Cornelius to come forward. I greet you all of you in the blessed name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. A very good morning to all of you and welcome to the house of God. We are here to hear His word this day and the message which the Lord has for all of us this day is on the theme of unity. Pass this message to us printed in our bulletin in the pastoral exhortation, is a prayer and a plea that we will protect the unity of the church. Our second hymn that we sang this day, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord, is an expression of the Christian's desire that we will all stay united as one body, the church. Today's message on the same theme of unity emphasizes that there cannot be any division in what God has united together. The title for today, as you have on screen and printed for you in your bulletins, No Desertion Nor Divorcement, Says the Lord. In January this year, our parliament in Singapore passed a Women's Charter Amendment Bill to take away, to repeal the section on divorce called Section 95 and then reenact a new section called Section 95A of the Charter. Although this amendment is not yet in effect and will only come into operation sometime next year, it is important to know what this new section allows for couples seeking divorce. It provides another option for couples to prove that their marriage is beyond repair or reconciliation, making it easier for a divorce. Until recently, there were five options or five ways to prove that a marriage was irretrievably broken down. One of which is that a spouse had committed adultery, and the Bible also allows divorce on the grounds of an adultery. Another option to prove a broken marriage is to show that a spouse behaves in a way that the other finds intolerable to live with. This has been found in the Women's Charter, Section 95. Yet another way to prove that a marriage cannot be salvaged, is to live separately for at least three years, and if both, party, both parties consent, still, after three years, they can proceed with a divorce. Now, even with these five ways of proving that a marriage is irretrievably broken, lawmakers still, still found these five options lacking. Because to prove that their marriage was on the rocks required one party to be blamed and often leading to an angry, acrimonious divorce instead of an amicable separation. Because one spouse had to point fingers against another, surely there would be arguments in the cause of proving why the marriage was beyond repair, beyond reconciliation. And so this new section passed as part of the amendment bill introduces a sixth option, the sixth way for couples to prove that their marriage together is no longer viable. And this sixth option is also known as Divorce by Mutual Agreement, or DMA for short. 
what DMA provides is joint responsibility for the breakdown of marriage. That is, both parties agree and prove to the court that they can no longer live together as a married couple without any fault finding or pinning the blame on one party. This makes it easier to file for a divorce based on reasons which may be considered respectful decisions to part ways. For example, having divergent views on how kids should be brought up. If that can be proven to the court that the parents' divergent opinions are so contrary that marriage cannot persist harmoniously, the court can grant for a divorce under DMA, Divorce by Mutual Agreement. Apart, then, apart, then, apart from making divorce easier without finger-pointing and hurting one party, lawmakers also explain that DMA benefits families by protecting children. This is especially so because sometimes children are required to testify against a parent's misbehavior, and that puts the child under lots of stress. So by mutually agreeing to divorce, the DMA and this amendment, which provides the sixth option, then prevents animosity between parents and paves the way for an amicable separation without detrimentally affecting children. It sounds good. However, while society may welcome such a considerate change and lawmakers ease the road for a divorce, Christians must remember the age-old prohibition against divorce. Why do we want to revisit the Bible's counsel on divorce today? When the world makes it easy for a divorce, and thereby weakening the sanctity of marriage, Christians must strengthen our understanding of what God instituted marriage to be. That both spouses must submit themselves one to another in the fear of God, which includes fearing and obeying God's insistence that what God hath put together, let not men put asunder. Husbands must love their wives. Wives must submit themselves unto their own husbands. Biblical Christians must tighten our explanations to those who have compromised their stand in order to accommodate divorce. In this congregation, we have older children and youths. This message on the biblical case against divorce is important to you also because as you look forward to your future and think if marriage is God's will for you, you must know that marriage is not a trivial matter. You cannot change your mind and then change your spouse after marriage. Divorce is prohibited in Scripture save on the grounds of adultery. So when you think about marrying someone, you must tell yourself what Jesus says about the permanence of the marriage bond, that only death can break the marriage bond, and that there is no way out of this marital covenant. You must be absolutely sure, dear children and youths, that before entering into a marriage covenant, the boy or girl whom you're considering is God's will for you, and once you are certain of that, then God's will for you is that you remain with that spouse. Granted, arguments will take over the sweet words which you once offered to your spouse. Perhaps soon you will find more things to disagree than to agree upon. And especially when children come into the family unit, parents have more stress on them as to how to bring up the children. Furthermore, personal sins, weaknesses, unrepentance of either spouse might frustrate the other. It is easier to leave than to stay. You must know that if you marry, you must stay all the way. And I pray that today's message would be ingrained in your youthful minds. 
to fellow peers, single young adults, and single adults in this congregation. You must also be reminded and reinforce your understanding of Scripture's teaching on divorce, because if, God's will, if God wills, you may get married in the days, months, or years to come. Or if you were to remain single, you must know that it's often the case that your years, the years of singles, become the listening years of the marital issues of your married friends. They often confide in singles. And singles are often caught in the crossfire between arguing spouse, arguing spouses. This happens in the world and in the church. It has happened in the past in this church, and it continues to be the case today. So singles must, in listening to the issues which go on between married couples, never condone the desires for divorce, but confront them according to how the Bible treats divorce. Even if the marital problems sound, and in some cases, almost impossible to solve, we must know God's directive will for us, what He has decreed marriage to be, and how we should view divorce. For, furthermore, we must believe that God's Word, which is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, is also profitable to teach us how to have sustained married lives, that spouses may be perfect, furnished unto every good work. So do not doubt God's word, which not only insists on the permanence of marriage, but also prepares them with its precepts on family life and how husbands and wives must relate to each other. Now to the married couples, both young, which includes myself, and older married couples, even couples who have raised children and perhaps now having grandchildren, the devil can tempt us with the thought to leave, to separate, to desert, to think that enough is enough. How beautiful is it to have older couples in our midst who express their love to each other, even after 30, 40, 50 years of marriage together. Surely, all the couples have gone through many more heartbreaking situations than younger couples have. Perhaps some were also at one point at the brink of divorce, but they took heed of Scripture's counsels on how husbands should be, how wives should be, performing the biblical roles of fathers and mothers and choosing to unite rather than to divide, choosing to reconcile rather than revenge. I believe that this is the sentiment of Paul when he wrote to Titus in Titus 2, 3 to 5. Listen to these words. Verse 3 reads, The aged, the aged women likewise that they be in behaviour as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keep us at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, obedient to their own husbands, rather, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Aged women knew that it, is, that it isn't easy to love their husbands and to love their children all the time, nor to be obedient to their own husbands all the time. They knew it was difficult. Husbands and children can be quite unlikable at times. And that's why, by example, Older couples must show to younger couples by their example to love their spouse even when it is difficult to love. The senior fellowship of this church, especially couples in the senior fellowship, must know that middle-aged adults, young adults and youths observe how married couples are at your age and how you express love to your spouse. But sometimes, and I speak from a personal observation, it seems that some couples in the church, while not legally divorced, they are practically separated. 
we hardly see them together. Of course, we acknowledge that in times of service, whether playing the piano, ushering, or chairing, you may be separated for a while. But these are exceptions. On a typical day in church, some spouses prefer distance from the other. And whenever some couples talk, you can sense that there is no more mutual respect, no more mutual love. This is not God's will for husbands and wives. Our passage for responsive reading, Ephesians chapter 5, is the standard of how husbands and wives should relate to each other regardless of age. So long as you are married, you must show Christ's love in the marriage. Even if a Christian has an unbelieving spouse, whether you are unequally yoked from the start against God's counsel, or you believed in Jesus after marriage and your spouse remains an unbeliever, God's will for you is not to leave your spouse, for by your marriage, by your commitment to the unbelieving spouse, you may win him or her for Christ. By your unwavering testimony and by your love for him or her, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 13-14, that the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Why? For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else... Were your children unclean, but now they are holy. Our Creator God is a covenant God, and His covenant is to believers and their family and their house. God takes an interest in the family. The gospel, which is introduced to your unbelieving spouses and children through your testimony at home, will work in them according to God's timing. So don't divorce your unbelieving spouses no matter how difficult it is. Peter likewise says, Ye wives, in 1 Peter 3, 1, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Even if a believing spouse may at times be disobedient to God's word, the believing spouse cannot at this time choose to leave. Now, let me repeat. I'm, I don't want to make a mistake in explaining. Even if a believing spouse, a Christian spouse, disobeys God's word, the other believing spouse cannot choose to leave. Peter still exhorts that wives subject or submit to your own husbands. Submission is not compromise on God's truth in agreement to the disobedience of the, disobedience of the spouse, but by your biblical conversation, in accordance to God's truth, you may win them for Christ. And so I pray that the Holy Spirit will work in all our hearts this day, that we, may, that the, that we will affirm that divorce is unbiblical and repent if we have been harboring such thoughts in our hearts. Also, as we begin, I pray that we will not think that this message is good for someone else in church, but that all of us will humbly acknowledge that whoever gets married will have the temptation to consider divorce. And if the devil has its way instead of the Spirit of God, who brings God's words to us, then we will choose the easy escape from the trials of marriage. We will listen to the devil's tempting to divorce rather than the spirit's prompting to love each other and submit ourselves to God. In this message, we will look at six reasons why divorce is wrong on all counts. That there is no exception, save the exception of adultery. Divorce is wrong for six reasons. Firstly, because divorce divides what God unites. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 19, verse 3 to 6. Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 to 6. This will be the first passage that we will look at. 
Matthew chapter 19, and I will read verses 3 to 6. The Pharisees also came unto him, that is Jesus, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he, Jesus, answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall leave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Jesus here was quoting Genesis 2, 24, verse 6. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Divorce is wrong because it breaks up what God joined together. Twain becomes one flesh through marriage, but divorce halves what God has joined as one. You tear the one flesh union apart when you choose to divorce. And that is the connotation when we read the phrase, let not man put asunder. Asunder is a sharp severing of a tight bond. Divorce is gruesome. Divorce is never meant to be amicable. But the world has done its best to ensure that legally, administratively, one may smoothen the process and ease the ways to prove that divorce is necessary, thus leading to an amicable separation. But the reality of it is that there is a breaking apart a dividing of what God had joined together. Marriage joins two as one when each leaves their father and mother and cleaves to the other. They become one unit, one whole. And this was so from the creation of men. This was God's created model of how marriage should be, that two become one. When divorce occurs, God's created and intended union is broken, it is divided by you. In Matthew chapter 19, the Pharisees taunted Christ by asking, on what grounds is it lawful for a man to put away or divorce his wife? Can every or any cause be sufficient ground for a divorce? Basically, based on one's whims and fancy. In the Jewish mind, there were two schools of thoughts that differed on the grounds for divorce. In one called the Hillel school, they allowed husbands to divorce their wives on very trivial things. I will be quoting a translation of the Mishnah, which is the oral tradition of the Jews in their interpretation of the Old Testament. And this quotation would attempt to, try to interpret Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. Now I quote from the Mishnah, Gitin 9, paragraph 10. And Beit Hillel, Beit Hillel means the house of Hillel or the school of Hillel, say, he may divorce her even due to a minor issue. For example, because she burned or oversalted his dish. As it is stated, quoting Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, because he has found some unseemly matter in her, meaning that he found any type of shortcoming in her. I still continue in quoting this translation of the Mishnah. Rabbi Akiva says, he may divorce her, even if he found another woman who is better looking than her and wishes to marry her. As it is stated in that verse, referring to Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, and it comes to pass if she finds no favour in his eyes. Unquote. So what is this verse which gives them this interpretation that a Jew can divorce his wife on the grounds of, on, uh, on the grounds of poor cooking, of oversalting the dish, or on the grounds of finding a woman more beautiful than his wife? They have misinterpreted and twisted Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. So please turn your Bibles to that verse. This is the law of Moses. And in the Jewish mind, they think that the law of Moses allow or give 
um, gr- give the grounds for a divorce based on even minor issues. How did they come about with this interpretation? Let's read Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. It reads, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favour in his eyes because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. Now, if they interpret the word uncleanness not as sexual uncleanness, but uh, sexual uncleanness like adultery, but they interpreted that word in a very generic way. And I quote how they translate Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1 because he hath found some unseemly matter in her. Our King James translation correctly translates because he hath found some uncleanness in her. Whereas in the Mishnah, it explains that just because there is some unseemly matter in her. What is unseemly? In the interpretation of the school of Hillel, it includes over-salting your dish or burning your dish. That is considered unseemly. Now, the divorce by mutual agreement makes it easier for a spouse to divorce the other over any unseemly matter. The DMA, Divorce by Mutual Agreement, is a modern-day Pharisaic take on divorce. For any cause, for any unseemly matter, couples can choose to divorce, so long as they can prove that they cannot stay together anymore because of that disagreement, because of that unseemly matter, and that is made easy today. Just as in Jesus' time, we must say in response to the many opinions on what constitutes sufficient cause for separation in a marriage, that what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So to every heart, hear what Jesus says in response to the question, is it lawful to put away a spouse for any cause? The answer is that it is not lawful, biblically speaking, to put away your spouse for every cause, because divorce divides what God has united. Divorce halves what God has joined as one. And this is the first reason why divorce is wrong. The second, divorce, the second reason why divorce is wrong is because divorce comes from the hardness of the heart. Let's look at verse 7, Matthew chapter 19, now verses 7 to 9. Divorce comes from the hardness of the heart. This is from Matthew chapter 19, verses 7 to 9. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? They're still thinking of Deuteronomy 24.1. He saith unto them, Jesus responds, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you, allowed you to put away your wives, but... From the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put his wife, put away his wife, except it be for, the, for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. So very plainly Jesus says that divorce comes from the hardness of your heart. Some who have been wronged in a marital relationship and who want a divorce may say, do you know how hurt I was by his or her actions? Do you know how heartbroken I was by what he or she did to me? When we listen to these stories and these recounts, which may be true, we tend to be swayed by the emotions of the party that was wronged. However, Divorce comes not from how heartbroken you were or how hurt you were by the insensitive actions of your spouse. Jesus says that it comes from the hardness of your heart. Jesus had definitely said that divorce is unlawful. The Pharisees, citing or remembering Deuteronomy 24.1, asked, how is it that Moses commanded that wives 
could write off the, their, sorry, that husbands could write off their wives with a bill of divorcement. And so Jesus explains that this was not so from the beginning of time or for the, from the creation of the world at the very first institution of marriage. There was never such permission nor such practice of divorce. This was never God's will for us, nor was it ever done by any man before the time of Moses. We never read of Adam or Seth or Noah or Abraham who put away their wives, though Abraham took Hagar out of his lack of faith that God would provide seed through Sarah. But he did not put away Sarah. So those whose hearts are determined to do your will against God's will have hardened your hearts. If you insist on divorcing, you have hardened your hearts and your desire to divorce comes from your hardened hearts. We know that in Scripture, the hardening of hearts is not a good thing. The hardening of one's heart shows one's refusal to obey God's command. A soft heart is ready to receive and react according to God's command. A hardened heart is rebellious. Pharaoh hardened his heart against God's command to let his people go. From Exodus chapter 7 to 8. Israel is described as one who had hardened their necks. They were a stiff-necked people. We find this in Nehemiah chapter 9. Some wicked kings of Israel and of Judah were also described in a similar way. For example, the last king of Judah, King Zedekiah, was described in 2 Chronicles 36 as having hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. He refused to turn to God. Nebuchadnezzar is described to have hardened, to have been hardened in his pride, from Daniel chapter 5. The Gospel of Mark records that the unbelieving followers of Jesus who witnessed Jesus' miracles were indeed false disciples. They considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Mark 6, 52. Paul warns Christians, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, but exhort one another, one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. To harden your heart is to succumb to the deceitfulness of sin. If you harden your heart against God's created pattern for marriage, that it was to be a permanent union which no man should break, you sin against God. By comparing Scripture with Scripture, divorce is a sin. Except in the case of adultery, as Jesus himself gives the exception. And this, if you realize by now, is consistent with Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. You may put away her if there is uncleanness or sexual uncleanness, fornication, adultery. The Old Testament and the New Testament are harmonious. The old is in the new explained. Jesus explains that divorce is unlawful, that divorce is sinning, is hardening against God's command, except if divorce is decided for reason of adultery. Now, it is significant to note that this exception clause, except it be for fornication, is found only in Matthew chapter 19. Mark chapter 10, verses 1 to 12, and Luke chapter 16, verse 18, are parallel passages on marriage, as spoken by Jesus. But in these places, in Mark and Luke, the exception clause is absent. Why is it so? It is to emphasize the principle that the marriage covenant is binding. Jesus was highlighting the rule, highlighting the principle, not the exception. Once you are married, you must never divorce. But if you insist on divorce, it is only on the grounds of adultery. Now, does that mean that if a spouse is caught in adultery, the biblical response is 
I must divorce him or her? No. If the wronged party has lost the wronged party, the one that was hurt, the innocent one, has lost all desire and has lost favour for the guilty one, the one who committed fornication, whereby there is no hope for reconciliation, divorce is permitted. However, if the wronged spouse, the innocent spouse, is able to forgive, is able to reconcile, the marriage covenant should be honoured and the couple must reconcile to each other, which means repentance on the part of the guilty one, forgiveness on the part of the wronged one, and together they reconcile. In other words, the preceptive will of God, that means God's commandments in the scripture, says no to divorce. However, due to sin, the permissive will of God allows for divorce in the case of fornication. A youth in our midst once told me that if it weren't for this youth and this youth's siblings, the parents would have longed divorced, would have long been divorced. To the youth's mind, the only thing holding back a divorce was the children and the children's dependence on the parents. And so for the sake of the children, the parents refrained from divorce. And it was such a saddening thing to hear coming from the child, the youth. If that truly is the reason why divorce is delayed, then the parents would find no reason to remain together when the children are grown up and married off. What keeps a husband and a wife together ultimately is not children, but their commitment to honour the principle that marriage is permanent and the covenant is binding as God has designed it from creation. Divorce is wrong because it is against God's created unity and that it is from the hardness of one's heart. And now thirdly, simply because God hates divorce. Let's turn our Bibles to Malachi chapter 2, verse 16. God hates divorce is the third reason why divorce is wrong. Malachi chapter 2, verse 16. Malachi chapter 2, verse 16. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. Putting away means divorce. Now, I should be reading, in fact, from verses 11 to build this context for all of us. So please join me as I Read for you from verses 11 to 16. Malachi 2, 11. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. What is this treacherous abomination? For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. So they married the heathen, the unbelieving ones, and in so doing, they worshipped idols. Now, verse 12 and 13. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this have he done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears and weeping and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with goodwill at your hand. There's a lot of show of religiosity, but they had gone a whoring for other gods, but they could cry and weep. All these were fake tears. And the people were still not satisfied with the Lord's explanation to why they have dealt treacherously. And so they respond in verse 14, which Malachi reports in indirect speech. Yet he say, Wherefore? Wherefore are we treacherous? Wherefore have we committed an abomination? Malachi explains, Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth. Against whom, against the wife of thy youth, thou hast dealt treacherously. That means they have done something so bad to hurt their first wife, the one whom they had married as a young man. 
Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. So they did not utterly leave, but deserted their first wife, deserted her and left and went after other women, married the daughter of a strange God. Now, in insisting that the Lord made one woman for a man, Malachi reasons, and did not he, God, make one? Yet, he, yet had he the residue of the Spirit. And wherefore one? Malachi is saying that God did not create one lady or one woman for man, Adam, only because he had, uh, because he had no more power. It is not because he had no more power to create more. It was his pattern, it was God's pattern that one man and one woman forms that marital union. He had the abilities. God had the power to create more. But the pattern, the model is one, is to one. Wherefore one, verse 15 continues, the reason that he might seek a godly seed. The seed must be preserved in Judah, not after the other godless women from the neighboring nations. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. And then he goes on in verse 16. The Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. He hates deserting. He hates divorcing. For one covereth violence with his garment. There's a lot of cover up. There's a lot of show and tell. But underneath it was abomination. Saith the Lord of hosts, therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. So all those who insist that divorce is out of love for themselves and what they want, and what they want for their peace, what they want for their sanity of mind, they please themselves, but they do not please God. God says he hates putting away, he hates divorce. Simply, this is the third reason for why divorce is wrong. God hates putting away, God hates divorce. Now, you may then say, if there is no escape from marriage, in the sense that you can't run away from marriage once you're in it, you might then respond like how the disciples did in Matthew chapter 19, verse 10. So let's turn our Bibles back to Matthew chapter 19, verse 10. Matthew chapter 19, verse 10 in response to Jesus' teaching that divorce is unbiblical, marriage is permanent, there is no grounds for divorce save fornication within the marriage, the disciples respond in verse 10, His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, if such is the case that there is no escape from marriage, the disciples said, It is not good to marry. By the way, the word disciples here does not refer to the 12 disciples, but in general to the followers of Jesus. So this tells us that in the psyche of the Jews at that time, it was so prevalent to disregard marriage. There was no consideration nor reverence for the permanence of marriage, which is how God first instituted. While the disciples said it is not good to marry, the Apostle Paul says that it is better to marry than to burn in your lust. So let's go now to the next passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and see what the Apostle Paul teaches by the inspiration of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. Now don't think that marriage is restricting. Don't think that marriage is suffocating. Scripture teaches us to think of it well. What is the reason that we should think highly of marriage? Look at 1 Corinthians 7, verse 9. By the inspiration of God, Paul says, But if they cannot contain, that is, control themselves, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Burn in their lusts, and then lead them to very destructive situations, destroying themselves, burning themselves. This is one of the reasons, in fact, why marriage was instituted to prevent burning in one's lust, to prevent fornication. Paul restates this truth 
in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. We read in 1 Corinthians that it is better to marry than to burn. Now, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, Paul says, Marriage is honourable in all, and the bed undefiled. Sexual union between husband and wife is honourable. There is no shame in it. But outside marriage, outside the union of husband and wife, it is fornication. And whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Marriage, Paul says, is honourable because it is a remedy against fornication. God hates fornicators. And so if one will burn in his lust, God's remedy for you is marriage. And then, by way of deduction, if marriage is honourable in all, divorce is deplorable in all, except in the case of fornication. I would like to remind us all of what is usually read out in the holy matrimony service of couples. In particular, the paragraph which speaks of the three biblical purposes of marriage based on Scripture. And here I quote a familiar line which the minister would say, First, marriage was ordained for the procreation of children to be brought up in the fear and nurture of the Lord and to the praise of His name. Secondly, and this is noteworthy, it was ordained for a remedy against sin and to avoid fornication, that such persons as have not the gift of continency or the gift of singlehood might marry and keep themselves undefiled members of Christ's body. Thirdly, it was ordained for mutual society, help and comfort, companionship, that the one ought to have of the other, both in prosperity and in adversity. Unquote. These three reasons are declared publicly to both believers and unbelievers who gather to witness our weddings. And these are God's purposes in instituting marriage. So this leads us to the fourth reason why divorce is bad or wrong. Divorce is wrong because divorce hastens us to fornication. If, div if marriage prevents us or is the remedy from fornication, escaping this remedy or rejecting this God-given remedy then tempts you to fornication. It hastens you towards fornication. Divorce is wrong because you have rejected God's remedy for you. Those who do not have the gift of continence, of singlehood, who cannot contain themselves and know that they will burn in lust, God's remedy for you is marriage. And if you are in that marital bond, enjoying this divine remedy against fornication, why do you want to run away from God's remedy? By escaping it, you bring yourself to lots of temptations where you will fall into fornication. So divorce is wrong because it hastens us to fornication. Let's review what we have covered thus far. Divorce is wrong because it divides what God unites. What God has joined together, let not men put asunder. Divorce is wrong because it comes from the hardness of your heart. That is rebellion against God and His command. And we have established that that is sin. Thirdly, divorce is wrong because God hates divorce. We need no more elaboration than that. And fourthly, divorce is wrong because divorce hastens us towards fornication. Now going back to 1 Corinthians 7, let us go back to 1 Corinthians 7. We will now enter into a passage which talks about remarriage, but that is not the focus of our topic today. However, we will read it because some phrases in this teaching on remarriage indicate the biblical view on divorce, and that 
is worthy of our consideration. So let's look at verse 10 and 11. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 and 11. Verse 10 reads, And unto the merit I command, yet not I, says Paul, but the Lord. What is the command? Let not the wife depart from her husband, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. Observe two things. First, that this is a command from God. The spouse, in this case the wife, must not depart from her husband. Secondly, observe that the word depart is used. A general word, a more general word, I would say, than putting away or divorce. Different words are chosen in verse 10 and in verse 11. What is the command from the Lord? Let not the wife depart from her husband. And in the next command in verse 11, let not the husband put away his wife. Depart is a more general, a more abstract concept, and divorce a more specific legal concept. Putting away, as indicated in verse 11. Depart includes desertion, leaving the spouse without legal procedure of divorce, but practically separated. Depart also suggests the idea of leaving without a trace, refusing to return. And so God's command, which we see putting both observations together, is that there can be no desertion and no divorce. If a spouse, however, disobeys this command and departs or deserts, leaves and separates, finds his own way, there should, no, there should not be remarriage by either spouse because, as the verse explains, reconciliation must be the aim of deserted spouses. Once you formalize it legally with a divorce, with a divorce certificate, there is no room for reconciliation. So Paul quickly adds, at the end of verse 11, let not the husband put away or divorce his wife. This, this leads us to the, fi the fifth reason why divorce is wrong. Divorce is wrong because it denies the possibility of reconciliation. Once you have legally acknowledged that you are no longer bound to your spouse, there is no more room for re reconciliation. If you, for any reason, have deserted your spouse, separated from your spouse, which is, again, prohibited by the Lord, as the Lord has commanded, your aim is not to walk towards a reification of that desertion by means of divorce, but your aim is to work towards reconciliation. That is the fifth reason why divorce is wrong. It denies spouses from the possibility of re reconciliation. Now, the sixth and the final reason why divorce is wrong comes from a theological reason. Divorce is wrong because it shames the love of Christ for the church. Let's turn our Bibles now to Ephesians chapter 5, a passage which we read for responsive reading. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 32. Divorce is wrong because it shames Christ's love for the church. Verse 25. 
Husbands, this is Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Christ's love for the church was a Sacrificial love, as we see, he gave himself for it. Christ's love for the church was a sanctifying love, as we read in 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the word. Sanctification both positionally by his very death and sacrifice. He sanctifies us positionally and progressively he sanctifies us by his word. That is his love expressed for us, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Next we see Christ's love is not only sacrificial, it is not only sanctifying, it is also supplying. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. The Lord nourishes the church by supplying us with all the grace, by our providing spiritual grace, by providing our physical needs. He supplies or supplies all our needs. That is the love which husbands must have in loving their wives. Husbands must have a sacrificial love in loving their wives, a sanctifying love to guide the wife into greater knowledge and obedience to the truth. Husbands must have a supplying love to provide and protect for their wife as they do for their own bodies. But when divorce is applied or divorce is, is enacted, where is this love? This love cannot be shown. We, for we, in verse 30, in verse 30, for we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. Wait a minute, this is familiar. We saw it in Genesis 2, 24, in Matthew chapter 19. Why is Paul bringing to our attention again? He explains, let me read 31 again. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Here, Paul explains that the physical union, which is inseparable, the, the permanent union between a husband and wife, is an example or represents the, the spiritual union of Christ and the church, that it is also inseparable. What can separate us from the love of God? Can famine, can pestilence, can nakedness, peril, the sword separate us from the love of God? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. The union, the permanent union between the husband and wife represents the spiritual union that Christ has for the church. They exemplify Christ's love for the church, which is one which can never be separated, which is one that can never be divided. In fact, this entire chapter began with the theme of love. Look at verse 1. Scroll up to verse 1 and 2. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Verse 2, walk, e, walk in love as Christ also have loved us and have given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. Christ's love, as mentioned, is a sacrificial love. But when you pursue after divorce, you do not sacrifice anything on your part. You are willing to follow what you want. Even if there are difficulties and challenges, you're not willing to sacrifice the hardship or to suffer through the hardship. Christ has demonstrated by his passive and active obedience what it is to sacrifice of a sacrificial love. And likewise, husbands must sacrifice in their love for their wives. If there's ever a separation in, instead of sacrifice, if there's ever a separation instead of a sanctifying love. Is as if there's ever a separation instead of a supplying love, you bring dishonor, you bring shame to God's, to Christ's love for the church. In fact, we go further to say that you blaspheme the love of Christ for the church when you divorce because you demonstrate, as Paul connects the two, that just as 
marriage is separable, you are then representing the separable love of Christ. But that is nonsense. It's unbiblical. Christ's love for the church is permanent. Nothing can separate Christ's love for the church. So the union, therefore, between the husband and wife must reflect this permanent love which Christ has for the church. Paul's application of how we demonstrate Christ's love in a family unit is when husbands love their wives to sanctify them, as seen in verse 26, which means leading them to the truth of God and to provide for his wife. This is what Jesus has done for us in dying for us, in giving us his word. And then we find the familiar words of God from the creation account, as we saw in verse 29, uh, sorry, verse 30. Paul explains that this is a great mystery and he speaks concerning Christ and the church. Paul spoke about the physical union between the husband and wife as a representation of the spiritual union between Christ and the church. When we believe in Jesus, we are joined to him. We become members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. As mentioned in verse 30, spiritually speaking, the church is the body of Christ, and then Christ is the head of the body, the church. You find that in verses 22 to 24. So there is an inseparable union between Christ and the church. Marriage between the husband and wife testifies of the union between Christ and the church. Exactly how it happens is mysterious, and Paul can't explain. But the least we can say, when I say Paul can't explain, Paul says that it is mysterious. But the least we can say is that a loving husband and a submissive wife represents the love of Christ to the church and the submission of the church to Christ as the head. This must be the testimony which marriage brings. Divorce, on the contrary, separates Christ's love from the church. It divides the union, and that's unthinkable. Because theologically speaking, there is no room for divorce in the analogy of the marriage of Christ to the church, his bride. So it is blasphemous to say that Christ would ever divorce his bride and the, that Christ would ever divorce his bride, the church. As God said through Malachi, God hates divorcing, God hates putting away. So divorce is not consistent with the love of Christ. If one chooses to go down the path of divorce, you shame, you blaspheme the love of Christ. Now concluding or wrapping up our thoughts, having gone through the six reasons why divorce is wrong, let me just quickly list them out once again to refresh. Firstly, divorce divides what God unites, that divorce comes from the hardness of the heart, that divorce, that God hates divorce, and so divorce is sin. Fourthly, that divorce hastens us to fornication. Fifthly, that divorce denies the couple of the possibility of reconciliation. And sixthly, divorce is wrong because it shames the love which Christ has for the, for the church. And so in wrapping up, I would like us to realize that God has not only given us the what is marriage supposed to be without giving us the how we can achieve this marriage. What I mean is that God has not just given us the principle on marriage that is permanent without giving us his precepts on how we can keep marriage permanent. And his precepts, the classic passage on how we can keep marriage permanent, is none other than Ephesians 5, that husbands must love their wives as Christ loved the church. Wives must submit themselves unto their own husbands, just as Christ is the head of the body, the church. This is God's preceptive will that we obey so that we can keep the permanence of marriage. If you choose to rebel, if you choose to disobey, ignore, then you would find yourself unable of your own accord, of your own abilities to preserve the marriage. It is my prayer 
as intimated at the introduction, that none of us would think that this is applicable for someone else. But all of us, especially those who are married, who then can possibly harbour the thought of divorce, of separation, of desertion, quickly repent if we have ever entertained such unbiblical thoughts because divorce is wrong through and through except on the count of adultery or fornication within the marriage. And for those who are single, it is not God's will for you to remain single if you cannot contain your lust. So get married and that is the divine remedy against fornication. To those who have the gift of singlehood, being born without the sexual urges, or the Lord has given you tremendous grace to control your urges and devote your life in service to Him, then when you hear of the sentiments, unbiblical sentiments of divorce in the congregation, your response is not to cheer them on, to condone them, but to challenge and to convict them by, not your own words, showing them from Scripture how divorce is wrong. And let this church stand firm in this understanding of Scripture that divorce is unbiblical, except on the, on the grounds of fornication. And yet, having said that, it is God's will that marriage is permanent, that if there is any wrong or offence, let both spouses reconcile with each other. The one who has done wrong, seek forgiveness from God and forgiveness from the spouse whom you have offended. And the one who has done wrong, repent of your sins. The one who is innocent, you must be ready to forgive. This is an exhibition, once again, of Christ's love for us. For has he ever failed to forgive us of our sins, despite our repeated rebellion? For oh, the love of Christ covers our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins. And so, exhibiting this love of Christ, may our marriages, may the husband, wife, father, mother unions that we see in this church, may the families of Gethsemane stay united and exhibit what is it to love your wives and to submit to your husbands. Let none in Gethsemane conform to the easy way out and run away from divorce and then opening up yourself to greater temptations, let us take heed of God's will for us concerning marriage. In closing, let us arise and sing as our prayer that the Lord will preserve us individually as families, collectively as a church, that our homes may be a godly home. Let us arise and sing the spiritual song, a prayer for a godly home that... We desire that the Lord will help us to, to have homes consecrated to God, every heart offered to do His will, cleansed by His precious blood, strengthened by His gracious word, so that our lives may be wholly Thine. Let us sing.
us join Elder Bunsyam as he leads us in the closing prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for speaking to us through preacher Cornelius, thy servant, instructing us so clearly about marriage which is instituted by thee and the reasons against divorcement. May we keep to heart the clear precepts on our roles as husbands and wives for our benefits and for the good of our families and this church. May we not forsake thy commandments, but to cling unto thy truth all the days of our lives. For we have to give an account to thee on how we have lived our lives, even in our marriage. Let us not live this century and continue our ungodly ways as though we have not heard thee today, but make us perfect in every good work to do thy will and to do all things well-pleasing in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Quiet moment with the Lord. The service is now over.